contrary to what the radical left is saying, America has been and still is the greatest country in the world. We are the shining city on the hill. Many Americans have died defending it. Now it's up to us to protect what the rest of the world envies. Economic opportunity for everybody, limited government, individual liberty. I will not let John Ossoff destroy the American dream for our children and our grandchildren. I'm David Perdue, and I approve this message. It is Morning Talk with Martha Zoller, and joining us right now is Senator David Perdue. That is the voice you just heard, and now we get to hear him live. Senator Perdue, thank you for being with us today. Hey, Martha. How you doing? I hope you're doing well. Good. Is it hard to listen to yourself? <laughs> oh, I hate it. I hate it. I sound so weird. I don't. It's like my children said. I just don't. I don't like it at all. <laughs> listen, um, you know, this was a very... Uh, a uh, similar ad to what you did in 2014, where it's you talking to the camera and telling people what it is you want to accomplish. And there's nobody that's better at it than you. You're not going to say that, but I will. Um, tell us a little bit about what this week is like, because I know you're getting out around Georgia this week. Well, thank you, Martha. I, I don't, I don't agree with you. I think I'm not very good on on camera. I, I, I really, but that's not the issue. The issue is trying to get the truth out, and, and I appreciate you allowing me to do that uh, today to a degree. Look, uh, we've been, over the last four months, um, we've been reaching out to people in Georgia. That's been our primary focus as we all sheltered in place and, and combated this virus. We've reached almost a million people through our constituent conference calls and listened to their needs and all that. And I'm encouraged, Martha, because I hear stories of how people all over the state are helping their neighbors, how they're helping each other, how companies are shutting down their business to open up uh, uh, the manufacturing of masks and that sort of thing, uh, providing food for hospital workers, host, uh, motels opening up their doors for nurses to spend the night so they don't have to go home and potentially infect their families. I mean, it's an encouraging time. At the same time, people are very unsettled. And, I, you know, as you shut the economy down and start to reopen, it's going to be unsettled. We just need to keep following the protocols, open the economy, get our schools going again, and get back to normal here while we continue to fight this virus. You know, you and I are lifelong Georgians, and, and we have seen a lot in the state of Georgia. And we went through the civil rights movement with peaceful protests, not much violence. Even the death of Martin Luther King Jr., we didn't have the kind of violence in Georgia that they had in other places around the country. But over the last weeks, we have had the kind of violence in Georgia that... Um, you know, we haven't seen. And I, and I want to take my hat off to the people down in Glen County because, because around the Ahmaud Arbery case, they've had peaceful protests every single day for months related to that case, and there's no coverage of that, and that has been peaceful. But we had violence in Atlanta that you and I haven't seen. Um, tell us about, you know, first of all, what that, how that feels to you, but also what we need to do going forward. Well, Martha, it hurts my heart. Um, my dad integrated one of the first school systems in Georgia. He was in, in, a teacher, and my mom was a teacher. And my dad revered uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He had me read his letter that he wrote from the jail cell in Birmingham. Um, but he, Dr. King espoused peaceful change. He gave speeches. He drove a movement behind that. I, I think he'd be disappointed the way that peaceful movement has been overtaken by the radical left and the anarchists among us. I mean, look at our major cities, Seattle, Chicago, Atlanta. I mean, 31 people were shot and five died over the weekend in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, th these aren't peaceful protests that are causing this. These are outside agitators who want anarchy in their major cities. And most of these major, all these major cities that we're talking about are run by Democrats. So if you want a view of a, of a country that defunds the police, abolishes ICE, um, you know, and so forth, would, you would have anarchy, basically, and that's you're getting a glimpse at it. In Chicago alone, over the 4th of July, 87 people were shot and 17 died, for goodness sake, and even on Memorial Day, just a few weeks before, over 80 people were shot and 21 died. So you saw what happened in Seattle when the police were barred out of that area, and even in Atlanta, that's what happened in Atlanta. So I agree with Governor Kemp, who brought out the National Guard to bring law and order back to the city of Atlanta. Well, and it gives the police officers, by him having the National Guard protecting state buildings, because the Georgia State Patrol headquarters was vandalized over the weekend, 
it gives police officers and state patrol the opportunity to do what they bet they do best, which is be on the streets and, and enforce law and order. Well, Martha, you and I know, having grown up here, that Georgia has our first responders are, are the best in the country. I mean, they protect us honorably. The vast majority of people in uniform protect us honorably. Yes, we've had some isolated incidents, and those will be dealt with. The law is very clear, and they will be dealt with. On the other hand, we can't defund the police, and that's what the Democrats are really trying to perpetrate right now. Now they've backed off of a little bit because they see the reaction, but this law insists that you're seeing in the major cities is a portent of what could happen across our country if the Democrats get in control. And I'm, I keep saying that because I hear it on the floor of the Senate every week that people really do want to get rid of the police. They want to get rid of ICE. Um, they want to defund the military. And by the way, the last three U.S. presidents who were Democrats, Carter did it, Clinton did it, and President Obama did it, uh, along with uh, Joe Biden, they, they uh, reduced spending in our military by 25 percent. So it's all a common theme. And it's unacceptable, I think. Now, let's get back to, I know you're traveling the state on this uh, break, but you'll be back in Washington, and we've still, of course, got a budget to pass. We always have a budget to pass, it seems like. Uh, you're working hard, I know, in the working group, the budget working group. But, you know, give us some encouragement <laughs> that we're not going to keep spending the way we've been spending, because I can't even keep track of the numbers anymore, Senator Perdue. It's it's difficult. Martha. You know, you've been in my office up there. You you know I have I'm the only person in the Senate or the House that has a debt clock in my uh, little reception area there, and it's scary. Just in the last four months, we've added three trillion dollars to our debt. So we've gone from 23 trillion to 26 trillion. We're beginning to have a sober as a sober. People are beginning to be so sobered by how rapidly that exploded. In addition, the Federal Reserve increased its balance sheet from four trillion now to moving to $13.5 trillion with the decisions they made. This is territory that's unprecedented. I personally believe that the greatest threat facing America today is our federal debt. General Mattis agreed with that, said the greatest threat to our national security was our debt. It threatens our ability to take care of the sickest among us, the most needy among us. It, it threatens all of our social safety nets. This is something that has to be dealt with. We're now looking at, though, the later day, latter days of, of phasing out of uh, our uh, aid toward uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And look, we passed a $3 trillion aid package, 2.9 in relief to our small businesses and hospitals and, and so forth. And so far, about half of that money has been allocated. It seems to be working. We created 7 million jobs in just six weeks, um, largely in our small businesses who were recipients of the PPP program which averaged only $108,000 per loan, which is amazing. Some 5 million small businesses got loans in that program. And we still have $150 billion left there. So the realization here is that we've got to get after, and you know this is a long conversation, I'll, I'll cut it, but we've got to save Social Security and Medicare. That's where the real uptick in Medicaid, that, those are the things that are driving the debt forward. Uh, it's not our discretionary spending. It's not military spending. Those have all been pretty much level. As a matter of fact, we spend less today as a percentage of the economy on discretionary spending than we did in 2011. So it's all the mandatory expenses that are just exploding away from us. Well, I do hope that uh, we get this going. I mean, it is, it's scary to me. It keeps me up at night, uh, the the concern about the spending. I mean, I understand why we had to do what we do, had to do in the last three months. I understand that. And I don't think it's a 10-year fix anymore. It, we used to talk a lot about balancing the budget in 10 years. I think it's more like a mortgage now, you know, where you got to take a look and figure out maybe over 20 or 30 years. How can we get back in, on track? Am I off base there? that it's it's a little different problem than it was six years ago you know martha leave it to you to come up with a great characterization that's the best characterization i've heard is it really is a mortgage the idea of balancing in 10 years was always a budget gimmick in washington there's no way you can do that on the discretionary side let me give you why we spend five trillion dollars in the economy uh, in the in the government five trillion uh i don't know what a trillion is you know but i can understand the number five we only raised 3.8 a trillion in revenue. So we have a shortfall of 1.2 trillion. Our budget only covers the discretionary. That's all we have authority over is 1.3 trillion. So you tell me how I'm going to save 1.2 trillion dollars on a discretionary budget of 1.3 trillion. It can't be done. Even on 5 trillion, imagine if you had to go into your household budget and cut spending by about 25 to 30 percent 
how that would feel. Well, that's where we are as a country. We're, we're living about 25 to 30 percent beyond our means as a country. It's the best way I can characterize it. We can solve this over the next 30 years without, without really causing much displacement. But it takes some political courage, and the problem in Washington is with career politicians dominating, it's hard to get away from the self-interest versus the national interest. And so until we have a crisis like this, I think we're in one right now, uh, until we have a crisis, it's hard for those career politicians to get the, the courage up to really do make the tough decisions. David, good luck to you. We appreciate you on short notice being with us today, and um, we'll keep talking. Oh, it's always good to be with you, Martha. God bless you. Stay safe, okay? Thank